Good evening and welcome to the Orkney International Science Festival and Foraging Fortnight online. The Science Festival is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year and for the first time the full programme is being broadcast live across the world on our dedicated YouTube channel. Tonight it is my pleasure to introduce Eric Walker who joins us from the Highlands. Our guest this evening knew that he wanted a career in science straight after leaving school when he applied to study biochemistry at the Heriot Watt University in, Ab in Edinburgh. What he didn't expect was to develop a passion for astronomy later in life. As chairman of the Highlands Astronomical Society since 2009, he has built up a wealth of experience in capturing the beauty of the stars, testing his technology to its limits in the process. After retiring from a career in the distilling industry at Diageo, he has had the time to plow into his hobby, astrophotography, which has a strong community of amateur enthusiasts. Like the 18th century romantic astronomer, William Herschel, who had a brilliant career as music master before building telescopes in his middle age, Eric has a Caroline in his faithful protege, Alex Wright, who is joined tonight by her friends, Shan and Ollie from North Ronaldsey. Eric is broadcasting from Conan Bridge near Dingwall, whose Gaelic name, Scudail, likely derives from Old Norse, Scudal, meaning Valley of the Fine Views. With the BBC's Stargazing Live series, presented by Professor Brian Cox and Dara O'Brien, youth engagement in astronomy was catalyzed and the society grew to over 100 members in 2012. They then used the experiment to acquire funding to upgrade their observatory at Culloden. This evening's guest's biochemical background in tinkering with processes to produce polysaccharides shares commonalities with the minute adjustments needed to distill the stunning images of the sky at night he creates. Should you have any questions for Eric during the presentation, please enter them in the YouTube live chat. So, without further delay, here he is from the Highlands Astronomical Society, Eric Walker. Well, thank you very much for that glowing introduction, Alistair. I've never been compared to William Herschel before. <laughs> Don't think I ever will again. Uh, I'd like to welcome Alex Wright, Ollie Gibb and Shan Tarrant. They are the North Ronaldsey Astronomy Group and they'll be taking part in this live webcast and they'll report what they can actually see on the night. They are the North Ron Live Observing Team. <laughs> Alex, what's it like over there at the moment? Hello, Eric. It's raining. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, that's par for the course. That's not a problem, guys, because uh, what I've got to show you here will stand you in good stead for when it's absolutely guaranteed to be a clear sky tomorrow, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anyway, this slot is for absolute beginners. Absolutely anyone can do this. Uh, it can be done by naked eye viewing and commonly available binoculars like 8x40s or 10 by 50s. No telescopes are required at all. I'll be presenting this as if I was viewing from North Ronaldsey. You'll see SkyMap uh, software I'm using. It's a software called Stellarium. It's absolutely free and easy to use. Suits me down to the ground. Um, I will also be making an observing sheet available for download and we'll work out how to get that to you if you want to try observing for yourself. So, if we go to the first slide proper, I am going to be talking about the planets. I'm going to look at the planets. And the reason I'm doing this first is because that the planets, uh, Jupiter and Saturn, are low in the sky 
and they are going to set first. There are four planets that are currently visible to the naked eye in the autumn night sky. They are Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, and Venus. And if we go to the next slide, I'll show you how to find them. If you look due south at the moment, you will see what looks like two extremely bright stars in the sky. They are not stars, they are two planets, Jupiter, which is slightly brighter than Saturn up to its top left. Very, very easy to see. If you look at Jupiter with binoculars, you will actually see three or four bright dots either side of that planet. Those dots are what are called the Galilean moons. They're the moons that Galileo saw and they move, they change every few hours. It looks like they're moving across uh, to either side of the planet. And he worked out that the moons orbited Jupiter. He published this work and, of course, uh, in the times of the Spanish Inquisition, uh, nothing orbited anything else. The Earth was the centre of, of God's world and he was tried and convicted as being a heretic and confined to, uh, to, to um, house arrest effectively for the rest of his life. If you use binoculars to look at Saturn, you will you'll be unlikely to see the rings clearly. You need to keep your binoculars very steady on, on a wall or a post or something. But you will see a, an oval shape. It can also look a bit yellow and creamy. But that's your first two planets you can see tonight or tomorrow. If we go to the next slide, this is a fantastic sight at the moment. Mars is due east right just now, and it is almost at its closest point to us that it ever gets in its orbit. It is very bright, it is very clearly red, and uh, it's just a, a wonderful sight. In binoculars, you'll clearly see the nearly full circular shape. Okay, if we go to the next slide, I'm going to talk, oh yes, it's Venus. Now, Venus. Venus rises later in the evening. Um, it's best at about three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. Now, I don't know if many of you will be up at that time, but if you look at that planet through binoculars, it's extremely bright and you will see a gibbous Phase. Venus goes through all the phases that the Moon goes through, just at a different time period. It is actually so bright that you can see it during the daytime with binoculars if you know where it is. But you have to be very careful that you don't point your binoculars at the sun and damage or blind, your, blind yourself. Okay, so next slide please. The next thing we're going to look at, again, very, very easy to look at and find, is Selene's chariot or the moon. Next slide. The moon, again, obviously very easy to spot. And at the moment, or about 11 o'clock, it will be nearly southeast in the sky. The moon just now is 17 days old. It's in a waning phase and it's about 93% illuminated. It is, at 11 o'clock, it will be about two clenched fists above the horizon, and it will peak at about 3 a.m. In, it, in its height. Um, so if we go to the next slide, this is, uh, well, this is what you'd see if you took a photograph of it. But that's the phase of it. It's very nearly full. I say it's 93%. Uh, it, um, if you go to the next slide, I'll show you some very clear features that you can see both with the naked eye and very, very easily with binoculars. So the ocean of storms, that's the largest sea 
that you'll find on the moon. It is um, about 1,600 miles in length from top to bottom. And it's got about one and a half million square miles of, of area. The Sea of Rains to its top right is in actual fact the largest crater in the whole solar system. It was a crater that flooded with lava and it cooled slowly and smoothed over, so it looks like a sea. The Sea of Serenity, another easy to spot sea, it's of great interest to lunar geologists because it has a, a mass corner, a mass concentration, a place of high, high density and gravity. They're keen to find out what causes that. And the last sea is the Sea of Tranquility. It's actually faintly blue. And that's because of the mineral content of the rocks. It contains quite a bit of titanium. Next slide, please. Also, there are three craters and a mountain range I've picked out for you to spot. If you look at the top left, as you, as you look at the moon, there's a crater called Aristarchus. It's the brightest uh, feature on the moon. It's nearly double the brightness of most other lunar features. Uh, the crater is as deep as the Grand Canyon and extremely bright. If you look at the crater called Copernicus, you can see that there are masses amounts of rays coming out of it. It was an impact crater and all the ejecta caused those, those rays. And they are very clear to see. You'll see that with binoculars, no problem. And the final crater that we're looking at is Tycho. Again, an impact crater, very young. It's only about 108 million years old, so very young in lunar terms. And you'll see all the, the rays coming out of it. It was a huge impact crater. And all the ejecta have left traces of the, the material that got flung out when it was formed. And the last thing which you'll, I want you to have a look for are the Apennine Mountains. And those are the mountains that bound the Sea of Rains I referred to earlier. Now these are old. These were formed at about the time the moon itself formed four billion years ago. And next slide, please. The last thing I just want to point out to you in the Sea of Tranquility, Everyone asks, where did Apollo 11 land back in July 1969? It was in the Sea of Tranquility in that bottom left-hand corner. So there's a little bit of, bit of history for you. So has anybody got any questions? Any, any North Ron questions coming? Yes, yes. Can we ask a question? I never understand why the moon seems to rise in, at different places. Ah, right. Okay. The moon um, rises in a different place. It's about 50 minutes later every night. The reason for that, uh, Alex, is that the moon orbits the Earth um, faster. You know, it, 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 it goes around faster by about 13 degrees every single night. Um, if you work that out, uh, if you divide uh, 360 degrees in a circle by 13, you get a number 28. There are 24 hours in a day, so 24 uh, divided by 28 is about 50, 51 minutes. So that's why it's, it's, it's to do with the, the, the Earth's rotation orbit speed around, around the Earth, Alex. Uh, I think I could do with seeing a model of that, really, to understand. <laughs> well, I don't have one at hand, but yeah. <laughs> yes. oh, yeah, maybe we should have a go making one. <laughs> <laughs> you could do it quite easily, I'm sure you could. Yeah. Do we have any more moon questions? I was wondering who got the uh, the lucky chance to name those great those great place names. Oh my goodness, I I I, I don't know. It's um, it's convention in actual fact on this side of the moon to name them after old astronomers and things like that, whereas the Russian ones they are named after. Uh, they, they they researched the far side of the moon. They were the first to send in a, 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 you know, an orbit around and take pictures of the, the the far side of the moon, not the dark side of the moon. And yeah. so they're all named after Russian, famous Russian uh, philosophers and important people. Yeah. 
brilliant. Okay. Are you going to come on to this about the different names of the different moons? So, you know, I, I think you might have mentioned once about harvest moon. And... Oh, yeah, well, I, I can go into that. Yeah, the, every single moon has a different name. And you're right, there's harvest moon, um, there's wolf moon, there's all that. I can't remember the exact ones, but they, yeah. they have different names. Different cultures have different names for the, the same moon month. Um, and they've, they've just grown up through their either mythology or their culture. Or, yeah. for example, harvest moon. Harvest moons were actually used to gather and store, you know, grain or whatever um, in August or in September, should I say. Yeah. The last full moon two days ago was a harvest moon. Yeah. Right, I'm going to go on to the next uh, slide um, okay. just to keep things moving along a bit. Um, the next thing I want you to have a look for, uh, not so much in North Rollinsey, but wherever you Eric, are. Yeah. Do you have the time for a couple of questions from YouTube? I do. Yes. Um, so we have the first one is from Richard. He asks, what makes Aristarchus bright? Ah, there are two things. There are the mineral content of it. You know, the, uh, uh, the mineral content and how it was formed. It was, it formed and it, cool down slowly uh, the shape of it as well as um, it's it's i'm not parabolic that's wrong but it's curved in such a way that it reflects the light back really really effectively efficiently yeah the second question is from carrie and she asks um do you know why the other area of the moon we cannot see is jam-packed with craters. Uh -huh. How come there are so, so yeah. few on the area visible to us? That's on the far side of the moon that I think Carrie's referring to. Um, there are a couple of theories, and they're probably both um, equally valid. One is that the crust on this side is thinner and that there is more, you know, that it's, it's, it's been affected by the, the tidal pool, you know, of, of, of the earth and the moon on each other. So it's, it's, it's worked, it's put energy into it and it's worked, it's, it's worked it smooth, you know, with lava flows and things. Um, the other one is that uh, there's perhaps a degree of protection from the earth on uh, this side of the moon and anything that's, you know, when it was forming, that come and hit it was possibly taken up by the bigger object which was the earth first and that the other side where there's no protection it was bombarded you know with a lot more rocky things that were in space at the time of its formation okay right definitely going to the next uh definitely going to the next slides now right this is about learning how to kind of find your way about the the the, the sky and um, there are constellations which you do need to learn and there are asterisms Constellations are formally named areas of the sky, and they'll be well known to you, the Libra and Capricorn and Aries and Cygnus. But there are also asterisms, which are groups of stars which form easily recognisable patterns. And amateur astronomers tend to use these to help them find their way around the sky to go and look for objects with the binoculars or or, 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 or telescopes or whatever. So we're going to the next one, the next slide. If we look tonight, almost due south, south, southwest, and you look up to the area I've highlighted, there are three very bright stars in the constellations of Cygnus, Lyra, and Aquila the Eagle. If we go to the next slide, these stars are so bright, they are really, really stand out. And you can join them up with an imaginary triangle and we call that the Summer Triangle. I'll refer to it later and you bear off some of these stars and you'll find other things. So we go to the, the next slide. Um, this one will be very familiar to you. This is almost due north, north, northwest, and it's in the constellation of the Great Bear. Next slide. Most people, if not everyone, has heard about the Plough or the Big Dipper, seven stars. And you can use this to find um, lots of other features. It's like a signpost in the night sky. If we go to the next, uh, next slide, you can use the leg, the tail of the plough, and you arc round to a bright red star called Arcturus. 
And if we go to the next one, you can use the two pointer stars, they're called, in the front of the plough of the Big Dipper, and you draw an imaginary line straight up, and it takes you right to the pole star, and you follow that, and you're travelling due north. So the asterisms are extremely useful patterns of stars to help you find your way through the night sky. Okay, next one. Ah, I'm an, I'm an Arcadian, get me out of here. This is about navigation stars and also how to find them. This also, this does two things. These are used or by uh, people who need to navigate by the stars, like sailors and mountaineers. Um, but they are, again, also extremely useful for astronomers to find their way about the night sky and find other much more difficult to find objects. So we'll go to the next one. This table, I don't need you to know all the numbers. All I want this uh, table to show is that there are navigation stars all around the, um, the, the, the globe of the sky. So from north to east to south to west, there are navigation stars clearly visible. The magnitude numbers on the right, they are very bright stars. There are some extremely bright stars like Altair and Vega and Arcturus, Capella, and those are so bright, they can actually be seen through light clouds. So again, if you're sailing at sea, very useful if you can find a star like this to help you work out what your longitude and things are. So we go to the next slide. This will show you some of the navigation stars that we use. There are actually about 58 navigation stars and you can also use the planets as well. And there are tables that you refer to which can tell you where, where you are at any given time. So this is looking due north. I've already showed you how you would use the plough to find Arcturus and the pole star, which are navigation stars but there are other bright stars like Capella, um, Algol, Murfa, Cassiopeia, uh, ones in Cassiopeia. If we go, next slide. So we're traveling 90 degrees around the sky. Next slide, please, John. So this is going east. And again, you can see there's a whole heap of navigation stars in that part of the sky. Also the moon and Mars, and they are in the navigation tables. If we go, uh, due south now, next slide. Plenty of stars. There's your summer triangle. All of those three bright stars are navigation stars. Uh, you can see the Mars Mars as well as a navigation uh, point. Saturn's a navigation uh, point as well. And we'll go finally to the west. And again, lots of navigation stars. So these were selected because they were bright and because they are all over the sky. Very easy to see. Uh, it's useful to learn those bright stars because they help you find your way. Right, guys, you got a question by the look of it? Oh, yes, please. How easy is it to get confused between the brightest star and a planet? Not that, oh, well, um, no, not that, not that difficult. There's one thing, there's, there's a little, a rule in general in that stars tend to twinkle, whereas the planets are much more steady in general, in a very, very, very clear steady sky. That's not the case, stars are very steady. It's the starlight coming through the atmosphere that makes it appear to, to, to twinkle. So in most cases, um, Ollie, it's, 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 not, it, it's, it's not too difficult. Plus you'll see, if you look out tonight and have a look at Jupiter and Saturn and Mars, they are distinctly, they are just so bright. That you just wouldn't make a mistake like that, yeah. Great, thanks, Eric. No problem. Okay, if we I've go got a question board. from YouTube Fire away. for you, Eric. It's from Carrie, who asks, is the pole star different from the North Star? No, the pole star is exactly the same as the North Star. It's also called Polaris. Yeah, so it's exactly the same. Yeah. Okay, next slide, John. Okay, this is the ash of Yggdrasil. Now, this in actual fact is the Milky Way. The ash of Yggdrasil is old Norse mythology, which 
uh, assigned stories as to what was, you know, what the Milky Way was. They, they said it was a, a tree that supported the universe, but we know it as the Milky Way in our, uh, our place. John, the next one, please. The Milky Way at this time of year is absolutely fantastic. It is best placed to, to, to view. You can see it from horizon to horizon to from virtually the northeast to the southwest. And if you go to the next slide, it, you'll see that it's virtually overhead. If you have a completely clear sky, you will see this wide ribbon of milky cloud. We are actually looking through one of the arms of the, our spiral galaxy in the Milky Way. It is fantastic. And if you have very clear dark skies, dark skies like we have in North Ronaldsea, you will see darkness and clouds and features, even with the naked eye. It is wonderful. So if you go to the next one. This is looking at the northeast horizon through to the, 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 sort of the, the, the south. And if you go to the next slide, you will see that there are constellations which run through and are associated with this Milky Way. You have Auriga with the bright star Capella on the northeast limb, goes through very easy to identify constellations like Perseus is an upside down Y, Cassiopeia is a, a W, you have Cygnus, the swan, you can see the very bright star Deneb, which is the tail of the swan and its wings and its neck, and also Aquila, the eagle. Um, these constellations, it's worth learning where they are. You can either use the constellations to find the Milky Way or the Milky Way to find the constellations, whichever. Next slide, John. And this is going the other side, so towards the southwest horizon. John, next slide. And again, the constellations associated with it are those uh, last year mentioned, Aquila, Cygnus, and Capella. It is a wonderful sight. If you have medium, moderate light pollution, you will still see it. You'll still see faint haze, but you won't see the lovely cloudy detail or the darkness that's embedded in, in, in this Milky Way. It's still a wonderful thing to see. Okay, any questions coming from, from that one? Okay, we're going to the next next slide. Okay, clusters and clouds. Now, this is where it starts to get a little bit harder. Go on to the next slide. And we're looking due east. If we go to the next slide, now, this is where you really do need to be able to identify the constellations and another asterism. So there you have Auriga, the charioteer, with the bright navigation star Capella. It forms a little, nearly a hexagon type shape, as you can see. You have Perseus, the upside down Y that I was talking about. Cassiopeia, the W to the top left of the picture. And there are four bright stars in a square. They are unmistakable. When you look up at the sky, you will see them and they're in this very, very big square shape. Off the top left-hand corner of that square is a constellation called Andromeda. So just remember that just now. John, one, the next slide. So this is where you use the constellations to help you find objects in the night sky. So you have the upside down Y of Perseus. You go down the left hand leg as you're looking at it. You extend it and you will find a beautiful cluster of stars. Very, very clear in the night sky. Those are the Seven Sisters, the Pleiades, or in Japanese culture, Subaru. If any of you have a Subaru car, look at the logo on the front, and that is the, that's, the, that's the logo of the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters. 
those seven sisters, a little tale here, the seven sisters were used uh, in several cultures, actually. That they, Their armies of the day, they recruited archers, and archers had to have particularly good eyesight. The, if the archer, the potential archer, could see um, five or six stars in that cluster, they were deemed to be potentially suitable for training as an archer. If they saw, or they said they saw eight or nine stars, they were deemed as liars and wouldn't be even recruited into the army. So there's a little, uh, there's a little story for you. Uh, if we go to the next slide, John. Now, this is a, a tricky little thing to find, but you can see it. So we've got the upside down Y of Perseus. You travel up the leg, you go up the stalk of the upside down Y and extend it. And you use Cassiopeia as well. You go down the sort of middle middle bit of the, of, of the, of the valley, the left-hand valley, and you extend that. And pretty much in between it, if you look with the naked eye, you will see a hazy patch. In, in good, clear, dark skies. Take a pair of binoculars and you will see just an absolutely wonderful sight. It's, a, it's called the double cluster. It's just amazing. It's a young cluster. Um, their stars are only a few million years old and that is very young uh, in astronomical terms. I liken it to a jewel box in the sky. It is beautiful and i would seriously recommend you try and find that it's high in the sky just now so there's no atmosphere that distorts it it just looks absolutely wonderful and you can probably tell i really like it with the enthusiasm and in my voice the last one i want you to try and find if you go to the next slide john it's uh, the Andromeda galaxy. Now this is quite faint, but you can see it in a clear dark sky with the naked eye. You use Cassiopeia, the W constellation in the, the sky, and you look at the right hand, the three stars that form the right hand valley of the W, and you use that to point in the direction of the galaxy. You use the square of Pegasus and you come, you bear off the top left star of the square of Pegasus, head along a couple of stars in Andromeda, nick up a couple of stars, and you will see this faint smudge and it really is a smudge. If you look directly at it, strange enough, you won't see it. The cones of your eye are not sensitive enough to see this faint detail. So we astronomers use a technique called averted vision. You look slightly to the right and you bring into play the rods of your eyes, which are extremely sensitive to, to brightness, and you will see the smudge. What you're looking at here is the furthest thing anyone can see with the naked eye. That Andromeda galaxy is two and a half million light years away. It is really, really old. That galaxy is what we would call one of our sister galaxies. We, the Milky Way, is on a collision course with it. Don't get too anxious. It's a few billion years away before that collision happens and I would say it's highly unlikely that humankind will be on Earth at that time, so I wouldn't worry about it. This is another uh, feature that is definitely worth looking at in binoculars. Once you've located it, take your binoculars and find it, and you can actually see the dense core of this galaxy with binoculars. It's fantastic. It's a real achievement. This is a real real challenge you know for people to to, to try to try and, and and find it but that's 
That's all the things I'm going to ask you as beginners in astronomy to try and find. Um, uh, there's the North Ronaldsea Astronomy Group again. I can see they're going to ask me something again. Does the phase of the moon have an effect on the what stars you can see? Oh, yeah, very, very good question. That, uh, good question, that, Shan. Yes, it does. Um, when astronomers love to, when it's a new moon, so completely dark, no light pollution from the natural source of the moon, that will allow you to see anything, or, you know, absolutely anything if you've got good, good weather. Um, as the moon phase works towards, you know, half moon, um, it does start to dilute things out, although it's quite late rising, so you still get good observing opportunities when it's a, a, a waxing, sorry, a wane, yeah, waxing moon when it's going towards a full moon. You still got plenty of time, a reasonable time to, to observe. Full moon is just horrendous. It is, it's like a bright torchlight in the sky, and it really does. It dilutes out almost everything apart from the navigation stars I referred to earlier. The waning moon tonight, even though it's 93% bright, you'll see from that sky map, it's very low. So it's not really up for that long and you will, you should be able to see in a good clear dark sky, you should be able to see um, the, those features that I've pointed out to you tonight, the, the clusters and the, con and, the, and the galaxy. Go another few days and the waning moon doesn't bother you at night at all. It comes up so late. Another thing that people don't realize with the moon, especially in the waning moon, you can see the moon during the day. A lot of people don't realize that you can, you know, that you know, 11 o'clock, one o'clock in the afternoon, you will see the moon and you can look at the moon with binoculars and you'll see some of the features that are a bit more bluey gray um, than, than, than the, the picture I showed you. But you will still be able to make out these very big, clear, distinct seas and uh, mountain ranges that I, I, I pointed out earlier. Does that help you, Sean? That's great. Thanks, Eric. I've got a couple of questions from YouTube as well, Eric, if you don't mind. No problem. Yeah. So uh, Carrie asks again, is there a good app to help with exploring the sky at night? Ah, good. Yeah, yes, there are. There are actually several extremely good, uh, good apps. Um, I, let's see, I'm, I've got my iPhone here, so just bear with me. I've typed in the wrong password. Um, okay, I use an app called Sky Safari Plus. Now that app is, uh, it's expensive in app terms. It's about 13 pounds, but you get free apps like Sky Charts. You get very low cost apps like Stellarium. So that's the app version of the free computer software I was using but that's only about two or three pounds. And you can hold your uh, iPhone or iPad or Android or whatever um, device you're using, you can literally point it up to the sky and it will identify what you are looking at. So great. The only caveat I would say with that is watch your night vision. You need good night vision. You know, your eyes have to be dark adapted. It takes 20 minutes, roughly, for your eyes to adapt to the dark. You look at a, a screen that's got a fair amount of white in it, white light, within two seconds, you've wiped out your dark ad adaptation. You know, it'll take you another 20 minutes again. There are settings. I, I, use, I do use my iPhone and my iPad, and I'm, I think you can do the same with Androids as well. You can set the screen such that you double-click it or triple-click it, and it will... You can make a red background and red light. You will not um, use your, uh, you won't lose your vision. The other thing, forget about apps. There is actually old technology. There's little books. And I, this one you can probably see is a bit thumbed. Uh, I carry this one all the time when I'm observing. It's an old, this is year 2000, I think I bought this one. A Collins gem book called Stars. And it has little, Sky maps, don't know whether you can see that, probably my background's interfering with that. Little sky maps and tells you about the stars and how bright they are and 
how to find them. Very easy. And there's another book I use called Stars and Planets. That's a bit bigger, but still not that big. And when you're wearing your ski jacket, because in the winter it is very cold in Scotland uh, outside at night, and you need to wear really good clothes because astronomy, it's not the most active pastime. But this book will fit into the big pockets in a ski jacket. So I would recommend um, those as well. So apps are great. I have to say the modern apps are superb. Um, but books, don't forget about books. There are magazines available. There's BBC Sky at Night, Astronomy Now. They give a monthly um, a monthly set of objects to go and find. Uh, online, there are fantastic resources online. Go to any astronomy club. They usually put up what can you see in the sky in the month of where you're located. Uh, regarding dark adaptation, actually, there's another device you need, and that is a red torch. <laughs> so you can read the books in the dark without using losing your dark adaptation. So that ties in exactly with what you were asking earlier, Shan. Thank you for the answer. Um, I've just got one more question there for you, Eric. Um, Pete Sherman asks, do you agree with me that the best way to start in astronomy is with binoculars rather than a telescope? I would absolutely agree with Pete. This is a, um, this is a common one, you know, I mean, obviously astronomy shops, dealers, they are desperate to sell their goods to you and you'll see them advertised in magazines and online all the time, beginners, scopes, how easy they are to use. Well, they're not. They are definitely not easy to use. Um, quite a few telescopes, good scopes, but they use mirrors and they tend to reverse the image, make it upside down, back left to right, back to front. And it's hard enough finding your way around the sky without uh, having the mirrors. I see these guys with all the binoculars sitting on their hands. Yes, binoculars are fantastic because they're easy to use. Most people have used binoculars at some time in their life, you know, in the going hill walking or anything like that. They are easy to use. You can look up at the sky, you can spot the bit of sky you want to look at, and you literally just point your binoculars at it. And it's, it's what you see is what you get. It's easy, easy to use. And by, as I say, like eight by 40s, eight by 50s, 10 by 50s, because they're fairly light in weight. If you buy heavy, big binoculars, it's actually hard to hold them steady and you get tired. Um, so the guys, you, you show the binoculars you guys were, you got there. Yeah, absolutely perfect. They are perfect things to use. And those will allow enough light in and they'll have enough of a, wide field of view that you can see these beautiful images those ones that you've just shown me see when i said the double cluster that i have to say that i love looking at have a look at them through those binoculars they'll be perfect yeah and um, carrie asks who wrote that stars and planets book that you held up the stars and planets book was written by ian ridpath he's a well well recognized uh, writer he also contributed to the Collins Gem Stars book. There's uh, Ian Ridpath and illustrations by a guy called Will Tyrion. In star chart and map books, those two are the go-to people. Any more, Alistair? Um, we have a question which is our which star is our closest neighbour? Oh, I think that's Alpha Centauri, if I remember rightly. Uh, four and a half light years away. So if you could travel at the speed of light, that's what it would take. But obviously we can't travel at the speed of light. From what I can gather, it's not a particularly interesting star to astronomers. Well, to amateur astronomers. There are much more beautiful things to see in the, in the sky at night than, than, the, than that one. But, but you know yeah. you can see you can see literally you know millions and billions and certainly millions of light years away when you start using telescopes and things. It's like looking into a time machine. It's kind of weird. <laughs> have you got a favourite spot uh, that you stargaze from, Eric? I have my own observatory, Ollie. 
I built uh, an observatory in my back garden. I've actually built two at one time, um, but I've got one just now, and uh, it's a 1.8 meter rotating dome, and it's got three scopes. My wife probably doesn't know all the number of scopes I really have, but uh, anyway, you always need one more than you actually have. But I've got a big 11 inch uh, reflecting telescope in there, and it's all hooked up to computers and astro cams and uh, cameras and all kinds of things. I do I do take astrophotography very seriously and publish my images online. And again, I don't do it necessarily for the science. I just I enjoy nature. I enjoy nature, whether it's land, sea, mountains, whatever. The stars at night are just another aspect of nature that I think is absolutely beautiful and we all should enjoy and protect, protect vigorously, you know, go for your dark sky status that, uh, status that I believe North Ron are going for. Yes, yes, we are. We're just, we've just got one final hurdle to get through because the council's not been able to convene and they've just got to approve a lighting document. Hopefully, and then we'll, then we'll get it. Yeah, that could be great. You could bring in astro tourists there, you know. Yes. <laughs> Sh should we be sort of thinking about fundraising to buy, to, to build a thing like you've got in your back garden? Is it um, I would, I, I would counsel you and just hang and fire on that. Um, I, I would wait to see what you know, how your club goes, how your group goes, and how your astro tourism ideas and things maybe develop. Alex, uh, I'd certainly be willing to, um, you know, help work with you on that. We did that a few years ago. Like Alistair, when he introduced me, you know, we built our uh, observatory uh, ten years ago or eleven years ago now. And uh, with quite a few hurdles and things to go through, it's um, yeah, and it's you know it's it's got to be maintained. You watch it isn't a mile a millstone around your neck kind of thing, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, it's very feasible to do. Well, thank you. Welcome. I wondered, uh, Alex, if you could um, tell us about how um, the moon. Uh, informs farming on North Ronald Sea. You, you came up with quite an interesting point the um, last time we spoke. <laughs> Vanished. There we go. Okay, well, actually, Sean, sh Sean's actually our. Oh, sorry. Did we, you were asking us, weren't you? Who were you asking that question to? Yes, yes. North, you. North Ronald Sea. Oh, yes, yes. It's, it's, to do, it's to do with this thing called punding. And I'm hoping Sean might jump in and correct me at any point. Um, the sheep, sheep sort of throughout the year need to be gathered up, say, for. For, for, for selling off island or for for, um, for shearing. So the, the sheep live on the shore. So to make it easy to catch the sheep, you need the tide to be as high as possible. So that's very dependent upon the moon. So when the moon is either high or new, the, the, the distance between the, the sort of the land and the sea is the smallest. So it's easiest to, it's, that's the easiest way to, to maneuver the sheep. So on North Ronald Day, on the high, the high and the new moons are at um, the tide is high at quarter to eleven in the morning. So we sort of know that's, that's time to go and get the sheep in. Thanks for that, um, Eric. Do you have anything um, more to say on the your subject of astronomy? For um, no, except that I will be doing um, I will be doing short talks at the lunchtime sessions in the PD, the PD cup. Ah, yes. um, it will um, be basically what you've seen tonight, but um, just, you know, a bit more focused with probably a bit, a little bit more detail. Um, uh, the other thing is, you know, I, I'll promote my, I'll promote my astronomy club, Highlands Astronomical Society. Please uh, look at it on the website. We use Facebook a lot. That's worth um, just uh, uh, seeing us or not, and I, North Ronald say Astronomy Group also have a Facebook page, uh, and we're also I'm also working very closely with Sigma, which is the Murray Astronomy Group. So again, we're all on Facebook. We're all local. We're very very keen to um, get new people, young people interested in looking up in the sky. It's a wonderful, wonderful sight and part of nature that some people miss out on. Just great. Yes, and uh, on that note, Eric, are the slides going to be available from your lunchtime talks? Yes, I'm currently working to uh, put them into um, downloadable um, chunks 
And I'm also going to put a little observing checklist on them so that uh, when you read them, you can go out and have a look and you can check them off once, you, when, when, once, you, once you've achieved them. So to give you some structure and maybe starting off your observing astronomy uh, hobby. <laughs> well, Eric, uh, that was a fascinating presentation. And I thanks to our speaker tonight, Eric Walker, our audience at home, Alex, Shan and Ollie for um, Thank you. participating as well. Um, I'd also like to thank the technical team, um, John, Reiner, Freya, Kathleen, who all made this possible. All this year's events at the Science Festival are free, but if you'd like to support the festival, you can donate through PayPal. You'll find a link in the description or on the right hand column if you're watching this on the website. Please do subscribe to the Orkney Science Festival YouTube channel and like us on Facebook. Thanks once again and good night. <laughs>